grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Get right with God. We've talked about that often. Uh, as growing up in North Carolina, particularly in the mountains, I've mentioned often that's where I, I, I first encountered it as, uh, you know, the curves. And, you, you know, they always warn you there's an S-curve, sharp, or, or you, and, but when you see these signs, get right with God. It, you know that there's a very dangerous sign because a lot of people have died there. And uh, the local churches have put this sign up just to remind you uh, that if you're not right with God, then drive very, very carefully so you have time to do so. Well, okay. Well, but this is the Old Testament. Uh, the prophets of old and of new, that's the principal concept. Get right with God. The problem is, is that we can't do that. We are not, God requires rightness with him. He says, if you want to be right with me, you got to be perfect. you got to be holy, for I am holy. Well, we can't do that because we're sinful, and we continue to be sinful. Even as Christians, we continue to live with sin, ours and others, and the consequences thereof. Getting right with God, but is what? The prophets of old said, it was the same kind of thing. Now, sometimes you'll see, the end is near. Well, that was the, the Old Testament prophecy. Repent. The kingdom of God is near. That was what we heard John the baptizer. That's what he preached. That's what Jesus preached. That the kingdom of heaven is near. Prepare. Repent and prepare the way. Jesus, uh, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So it is repentance that gets us right with God. Because God, God wants to forgive your sins. But he has a way that he has provided for, for us because he is, he is perfect and we're not. We're so imperfect that we can't even come to God. We can't know about God. We don't want to know about God from our sinful nature. We are sinful, unclean. We are an enemy of God. But God comes to us and calls us and gives us his Holy Spirit so that we can become holy, not because of what we do, but because of what he has done. And that's the way it has always been. God told Adam and Eve before he kicked him out of the garden, I'm going to send one, a Messiah, one of your seed who will crush Satan. And they expected it. <clears throat> Again, next was with Noah and the promise. And then Abraham. And then they began the time of God's people where he worked through them. And God gave them all sorts of, of remembrances. With Abraham, they started this, this covenant of, of circumcision. And then the descendants of Abraham, finally, till they got down to, to, uh, uh, to Joseph, and then uh, <coughs> the time of Joseph, when the whole family existing of Abraham at the time, then all went to Egypt. And the family stayed there for 400 years, you recall before they came out of Egypt, and then gathered around Mount Sinai. And there God gave them more directions. And he gave them a whole bucket full of object lessons. And, and the sacrificial system, the worship system, all of those kinds of things. Were, God was saying to them, you're sinners. But I want to forgive you your sins. You just have to remember that you, to repent of your sins. And here's some hints for you. And one of the things that he set down, besides the Ten Commandments, which is his main idea that help us know that you're a sinner because you can't keep those things. And in case we forgot or was misinterpreted, by the time it came to Jesus, he interpreted for everybody. And he said, oh, you were taught you shall not kill. But I tell you, Jesus said, Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. 
<laughs> and you know about brotherly love all the way back from Cain and Abel. Sometimes it gets pretty hateful. And it doesn't go to the point of actually physically bringing about somebody's death. But it does tell you to hate anybody. Brother is not just your biological. It's your brother or sister in humanity. If you hate anybody, you are a murderer. If you lust after anybody, you are a adulterer. If you are, you are an idolater, idolater, you are a thief, you are a covetous one, you are a, that's what the Ten Commandments is telling, you are a sinner. And in the Old Testament, God gave them a lot of, of examples of that. He said, you have to offer sacrifice for your sins. And there was, and they had to do it daily because they placed their sins upon uh, this animal and it died. Its blood was shed. It was tied up in the blood of the animal. And the blood being shed meant that God's punishment for sin is death. Uh, the New Testament. The wages of sin is death. Physical. Eternal. Death. That's a punishment. But God says, I want to forgive you. In fact, forgiveness is there for everybody. He said, and it's coming. See, that's what Abraham believed, that the Messiah, the anointed one, Christ, was coming. And he believed in those promises of God, even though several, few of them were, were completed by the time he died. But he believed. And the New Testament says, and his belief, his trust in the promises was accounted to him for righteousness. He, he had gotten right with God, not by what he had done, but by what God had done in, in Abraham. God had given him and proven to him that God keeps his promises. And that developed Abraham's belief, faith, and trust in God. And he lived. Not perfectly, but he did. And, but God, and, and, and God gave him circumcision as, as a remembrance. The concept was that Every day, the males, when they were cleansing themselves, they were reminded that they had a covenant with God who will cleanse their hearts and their souls. Circumcision was there as a reminder daily. One of the others that he gave was for women. And when they had a child, they gave blood in doing that. And, and, and it, was, it was an unclean concept. They were unclean for 40 days for the birth of a son. Ha! Twice that long for the birth of a woman, a girl. And was God punishing these women? No, it was a reminder. It says that your purification, you have to bring a sacrifice to, to the temple in order to be purified again and cleansed, in order to be at, get right with God again. It's a sign. It's a visible activity. It's the faith and trust that repentance of our sin, God will forgive you. The forgiveness is there. And that tradition, that custom, Luke calls it, there were many, many customs of, of uncleanness. That's what plays into the popular story, of a familiar story, of the, the Good Samaritan. He's the third guy that came along. Why? Because the first two guys were clergy or temple helpers. And if they had touched that bleeding, bloody body, they were unclean. And they could not go to the temple to perform their responsibilities. And so they had an excellent excuse to not help this 
near-death bleeding man on the side of the road because it would make them unclean ceremonially. Well, so and there were there were hundreds of other kinds of reminders of uncleanness, but they weren't talking about uncleanness of body. They're talking about uncleanness of mind and spirit. And God wanted to clean it, and that's what he gave us. You do this and do that. You do this, and, and I, you know, this is how you come to repent of your sin, to repent of your uncleanness, and I will purify you. Right? I will purify you. It's not something that you do because you wouldn't, you wouldn't even know about it without my word. So you have to hear my word and by the power of the Holy Spirit receive my word and then live my word, none of which you can do but by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it comes. And from the time of of Abraham to the time of Jesus, there were big time hints about this process of of the coming Messiah. We went through the three weeks of, of, of uh, Advent before Christmas on Wednesday night. We talked about the first one, Abraham and Sarah. Abraham, Sarah was a Sarah was 90 years old when Isaac was born. When Isaac was 90 years, that's a miracle. And, and <laughs> there's so much about that. Okay. But that's, that's the one. Then in the middle of, of the people of Israel, the middle of their time frame, uh, the Old Testament lesson for today, Elkanah and Hannah. Hannah was barren. She had not, and, and it, was, it, was, it was shame because if you couldn't bear children, then it was certain that the coming one was not going to be in your descendants. And so that was kind of shameful. And so Hannah, as it says, went to, the, to the, where the tent of meeting was, where the Ark of the Covenant, and, and, and Eli, uh, the next to the last of the judges of Israel, was tending to it. And that's where she went for prayer. And she prayed, and, and, and you recall that uh, Eli thought she was drunk because she was, her mouth was moving like she was mumbling. And he couldn't hear and understand. And uh, so he thought she was drunk. And, and she said, oh, no, I, I, I'm praying fervently to the Lord. Because of her barrenness, she wanted a son. And, and Eli, by the Spirit, having no idea what she asked, she says, God will grant you. <laughs> she went home and got pregnant. And, and had a son. And, and, and then uh, when it came time to, because uh, uh, she made a promise, she said, God, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you to serve you for his whole life. And you wonder if Samuel ever said, gee, thanks, Mom. <laughs> but, but he did. He did. He was the last judges of Israel. It was Samuel that was a transitioning between the time of the judges and the conquering of the promised land. He anointed Saul, and that didn't work out too well for him. So then he anointed David. He was the transitioning point between the time in Egypt, the time in the wilderness, the time in the conquering of the land, until finally they had kings. Not that God, they weren't happy with God's rule. They wanted kings like Everybody else has one. We want one too. Well, God gave it to them. And they said, what were we thinking? But that was the middle of the time of the people of Israel. And now we come to the time, uh, the close of the Old Testament. Elizabeth and Zechariah. Zechariah, another temple worker, a priest, and his barren, aged wife, Elizabeth. And the angel came to him while he was serving in the temple and says, you're going to have a child. And he said, what? And the angel struck him mute until he saw, yes. Can you imagine his sign line and his writing as he goes home to tell Elizabeth, we're going to have a child. She says, what? They did. 
It was the forerunner, the advancer, John the baptizer, the cousin. And, but then even more so, the final miracle came when the angel came to Mary and said, you're going to have the Messiah for your baby. And she says, I'm not even married. She says, okay, it's not going to be a husband that's going to impregnate you. It's going to be the Holy Spirit because this child is going to be holy. He is going to be born perfect. He is going to be a human, but he is going to be God. And that's what happened. And now it's time for Mary to fulfill the custom and go for her purification. Oh, by the way, did you hear it? As... as a person, a, a family of no means. They didn't have to bring a lot, just a couple of dove. And, and it's what they did. But did you catch what Elkanah and Hannah brought to the temple when she was bringing Samuel to the temple? Did you read that? Do you remember that? That wasn't two doves. That was a three-year-old bull and an ephah of flour. And other things, too. They were people of means. Mary presented to Duff. No, she didn't. She presented to the temple the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Did she not? That was Jesus, her baby. That's what Simeon recognized by the power of the Holy Spirit. God had told him that he was, he was not going to die physical death until he saw the Lord's salvation, the Messiah, the Christ. And the Spirit told him can you imagine his eagerness to get to church that day? That this was the day. And it's not like Jesus was the only baby that day. Because people had to come to Jerusalem for every child born sometime on the 40th day. They might have been, but not, you know. But he goes, and he knows this is the one. And he, he, he takes the child from from Mary, and he says, Lord, now I can die because I've seen your salvation. I have seen the Christ, the Messiah. I can, I can die in peace. I'm ready to go. And uh, This, which is the glory of your people Israel and a light to the Gentiles, to the nations, this is the one this is the one that you promised to Adam and Eve. This is the one that you promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the one that you have promised. And here he is in my arms. And, and Anna, most of her life, doing Bible studies in the temple, after the death of her husband, after only seven years of marriage, spends her life in the temple, serving where she can, speaking where she can, to people who come looking for the consolation, the redemption, the purifying, getting right with God. And she's, she's there that day. And now she sees the consolation, the redemption, the Christ, the Messiah, in the arms of Simeon. What a blessing. In our own lives, you have much to remind you every day that you're a sinner. You don't necessarily need to focus on circumcision or lack thereof. You don't need to focus on the boo-boos that cause bleeding and that blood is required uh, by God to make you pure, except that the blood of Christ, because that's what made us pure. Christ's blood on the cross was given and shed 
as a sacrifice for your sins, but not just your sins, but for the sins of the whole world. And you're not John the Baptist. You're not Elijah or Elisha. You're not Samuel. You're not, you're you. But God has called you to be his child. And he makes you his child by the word. Maybe even by baptism. When you understand the Word, and what God has done for you, and what blessing baptism is. And in a few moments, we're going to gather around His body and blood. His body and blood that He has given to us. This is my body. This is my blood. And it is there. You can't see it. All you see is bread and wine. But He says, Jesus, when He answers, He says, this is my body. This is my blood. Is, is, is. Because he also said, this is bread, this is wine. We don't understand that mystery. And until you do, and until you know how to prepare yourself to receive that, because whether you believe it or not, it's happening to you. That's a sacrament. Not a sacrifice. That's a sacrament. God is giving something to you. His body and blood. Why? Because he... Whether you want it or not, he's giving you forgiveness of sins. See, the problem is, if you don't understand that God is giving you forgiveness of sins, you are wasting it. You are, because receiving forgiveness of sins from God requires that we understand repentance of our sins that need forgiving. I'm really meddling now. Luther says, if you're carrying a grudge, in fact, it's in scriptures, if you're carrying a grudge against a brother or sister, against someone else of humanity, don't just stay away. What does he say? Bring your offering, make amends, and then come to receive his body and blood in Holy Communion. Because if you're carrying a grudge, that means that you're not willing to give the forgiveness that you have received to someone else. See, because God's imperatives, God's word and sacraments make things happen. Now, if you're weak in faith and you believe and you're prepared, that's why, do you see the note in the bulletin that says, if you understand this stuff, do you prepare yourself? And in last resorts, during the offering, read the, it's noted, right, after it said the offering thing. It's the page numbers in there. And it says, prepare yourself for Holy Communion to go through. Why? Because what it does reminds you that you're a sinner and you need forgiveness. It reminds you that God wants to forgive you. Forgiveness is yours. It's there. It's already provided. And it changes us. It changes the way we relate to one another. It changes. We now become the glory of God and a light to the Gentiles. Why? Because we're called Christians. Little Christ. Christ, we are the body of Christ. That's what communion does, is makes us the fellowship, the body of Christ, so that we go from this place with a unified, evangelistic fervor to help other people Get right with God. Can't do that by ourselves. We need help. We need word. We need sacraments. We need 
community, koinonia, fellowship, ecclesia. We need one another so that together in communion as the body of Christ, we can present a, a common front of joy in all of our reminders of our sinfulness, in joy in all of the consequences of sin that we suffer and others suffer around us. That we can meet all of that differently than the world does because Jesus gives us, as the angels proclaimed, peace toward those who are right with God. That peace that the world just doesn't understand. But that peace keeps our hearts and minds right with God, knowing, believing in the promises of God, even though they've maybe not been fulfilled in our lives or in our lifetime. God accounts our trust in Him for righteousness. It's the bad things that happen to us as the consequences, particularly of our sins or the sins of the world, that remind us that we are sinners. God uses all of that for good for His children. To say, be at peace, I'm in control. I know what's happening. You heard Hebrews. Jesus came so that we would know God understands because he lived through it all, only without sin. He will help you live with it. He will help you live through all of it, even also with your sin. That gives us the peace. We can live, and we can look forward to dying right with God. Amen. Amen.